I'm I'm moving on to the next one already, so you just have to get this lady. Um. So a sequence is an ordered progression of of numbers. Most people would call this just a pattern. Um, an infinite sequence is a sequence that goes on forever, right? So it's just going to keep going. It doesn't stop. So part of your homework today, it's not so bad. It says uh, find the first six terms and the hundredth term of the sequence A sub K in which A sub K exists. And so we're going to talk about um, what we're going to do today. Really not Find the first six terms, if you were going to write out this pattern, it would go 2, 7, 12, 17, 22, 27. And the part that we want to get to, maybe, is if I gave you the pattern, could you go back and give me the formula? Uh, this also says find the hundredth term, and very nicely, um, if you just had the numbers given to you and not the equation, how would you find the hundredth term? It might be kind of hard to do, but all we got to do is plug in a hundred to get the hundredth term. So I usually write this underneath here, but I'm out of room, so I'm just going to write it up here. The hundredth term we would write as a sub 100, and that would just be 500 minus 3, or 497. Make sure you watch your negative signs. Negative 2 squared would be positive 4. A sub 3 would be negative 8. A sub 4 would be positive 16. A sub 5 would be negative 32. And A sub 6 would be 64. Notice how it alternates negative signs. That's something to kind of think about looking at this pattern. Um, it's because even uh, powers are positive and odd powers are negative. And the hundredth term on this, whew, I wrote equals negative 2 to the hundredth, and then I wrote really big next to my uh, answer paper here. Um, my calculator gave it to me in scientific notation, which was like, I think, 1.267 times 10 to the 30th power. I think we've moved this 30 decimal places over, which would be a gigantic number.
Um, these formulas are called explicit formulas, meaning that um, you can plug in any number. And where we're going to go next week with this is we're going to write our own. Like, given a list of numbers, we're going to write our own equation, which is going to be easier and more comfortable. So today I really should get this tonight. Okay. There's another type of sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence, I'll just show you the pattern and then we'll talk about how they write the formula. But the Fibonacci sequence is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Can you figure out the pattern? Yeah, you have to, this is why it's called recursive. Because you have to know it starts with 1 and 1, and then after that, you add the two numbers before it to get the next number. So you have to know 1, well, I guess you could say 1 and 0 to get 1. 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, and it goes on and on and on, and that's the Fibonacci sequence. So the way that they write these, people kind of get confused by them sometimes, is they have to give you something in order to... Um, let you know what to do. So the Fibonacci sequence, we could say, and they start with zero on this, and that's something you have to kind of pay attention to. I normally think of the first term as being a sub one, but for the Fibonacci sequence, they say, well, the a sub zero is one, and a sub one is one, and then they give you a formula, and they say to find any value, a sub k, you take a sub k minus two plus a sub k minus one. And that just means you take the two terms, the term that's two terms below it, plus the one that's one term below it, and you add those together. And so I'll show you what I mean by this. And so if we were going to write these terms out, well, the first two, there's nothing to do. You just take a sub 0 equals 1, a sub 1 equals 1. And I've already told you the pattern, but I want to show you how this formula works, in that to find the next term would be a sub 2. That means k is 2, yes? So if I plug in 2 for k here, what does this term become? 2 minus 2 is 0, so you get a sub 0 plus 2 minus 1 is a sub 1. Which is why it is 1 plus 1 or the second term is two. So that's just another way of writing it. Like, whatever k is, you plug in k for there, and it's always going to give you the two right before it. And so just, I, we kind of wrote it out already, but just to say, like, if I was going to do a sub 4, 4 minus 2 is 2, plus 4 minus 1 is 3. So you take a sub 2 plus a sub 3, and that's how you get that next term. Does that make sense to what I'm saying there? Like that's what that formula means? So this will look be 0, 1, 2. So 2 plus 3 equals 5. No. You don't have to memorize the sequence because if I gave you something with this, they would give you these rules and you could work it out. That's just how they write the formula out. So you're right. This, we could just keep going with this. With any pattern, we could keep going with this. This is just the formula that you need to know if they give you a formula, you need to know how to use it to find the terms that they ask. 
Not all recursive sequences are the Fibonacci sequence. I just thought I would show you the Fibonacci sequence. We're going to do another example in a minute that's recursive, which means it's going to be different rules. Just like the last problem, they gave us this. This is the same thing, only there's just extra stuff involved because you have to use the one plus one. Maybe. They're not, mm, okay, let's look at another one. Fibonacci sequence is a special case. But let's look at another one. This is another recursive sequence. And the idea is I want you to recognize a recursive sequence as opposed to a, an explicit formula. An explicit formula, you don't need any other terms before it. You would have to actually just kind of work it out to that point, but you got to know how to get started. Like on the Fibonacci sequence, I kind of showed you the formula. I showed you the trick before I showed you the formula, which might be why you're like, why do I need this? On this one, you have to write out a few terms, and then you're right. Once you kind of get the pattern of what's happening, you can just keep going. But you have to start with the formula. Like, you have to know that in this problem, we're starting with 15, and then for every term after that, you're going to take h of k plus 3. And they're saying when k is greater than or equal to 1. Sometimes they start with h of 0, sometimes they start with h of 1. Like, it just depends on the project. It's a different formula. And so it's not a big deal. The only difference is if they start with h of 0, I'm not a big fan of that. Because I like to think of the third term as h of 3. But if they start with h of 0, then you have to count extra, right? Like, the third term would actually be h of 2. So I don't really enjoy that. But Fibonacci sequence is one example where they always start with h of 0. And we'll kind of get there. It kind of doesn't matter. We're going to write our own formulas. You're going to have your choice. You can start with 0. You can start with 1. It just depends on how you write the formula. On this one, write the first four terms and the eighth term. The first four, four terms, do you agree? The first term is 15. And then here's what recursive means. It means to use this formula, you have to know the one before it. And they tell us that k is starting greater than or equal to 1. So our first number that we're going to plug in here for k would be 1. So I'd actually get 1 plus 1, which would be a sub 2. Yes? And a sub 2 would be k is 1, a sub 1 plus 3, or 15 plus 3, which would be a 2. A recursive sequence just means you have to use the one before it in the problem. Once you do a few terms, you write. You can just keep the pattern going. So like for the next one, like this is when k equals 1, because 1 plus 1 is 2. If I did k equals 2, 2 plus 1 would be a sub 3, or the third term, yes? And what is a sub k now? a sub 2 plus 3, which is 18 plus 3. After you do like three terms, like if I was going to write this pattern out, I would have 15, 18, 21. Could you keep going now without using the formula every time? Yeah. Yes, and that's okay, but you need to understand what the formula means. If I give you that, you've got to be able to list those terms out. Caitlin. Because what if I said find the hundredth term? Could you find the hundredth term without having to write them all the way out to 100? So what's A99? You see what I'm saying? The difference between an explicit formula and a recursive formula is I could say find the thousandth term of an explicit formula, and you can just plug a thousand in for the problem, and you would get your answer right away. For recursive, if you, they say find the eighth term. Guess what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to go all the way to the eighth term. Does that make sense to what I'm saying? Like, that's the difference. So list the first four terms, 15, 18, 21. I can see I'm just adding 3 each time, so I know the first four terms are 20, eight, 15, 18, 21, 24. But to get to the eighth term, we don't have a way of doing that right now, except for to just list it out to the eighth term, because you need the one before it.
Actually, a formula eventually we're going to get to that we could do the hundredth term of this, but unless you think about it and you guys both found a nice little way of doing it that you know you're adding three each time. So, do you hear what they said over there? Since we're adding three each time, they said they could just count up how many threes we have to go to get the eighth term, or three times eight is 24, and then they added that to the first term, right? That's what you did? Yeah, but I got 39. Oh, so maybe it doesn't work. Well, I think you might just need to add one before that because you have to add up how many how many times are you adding three? And if you're going to the eighth term, you're only adding three seven times. You see know what I'm saying? And there actually is a formula that we're going to get to eventually that you can do that, and you guys kind of stumbled upon that already. But that's the big difference between recursive sequences and an explicit formula because you have to either figure out what you're doing each time or you have to just work it out. Questions about that? Oh, let's do another one. Same rules as the last one. So write the first four terms and then figure out the eighth term. What is your question? I think I'm kind of confused by that. B2? You have to... Yes or no? Like, do you get where I'm getting this from? When k is greater than or equal. 
equal to 1, which means your first number, we already have 2, the first number you can pick for k is 1. So I'm going to plug 1 into this problem, and 1 plus 1 would give me b sub 2, which is what I wrote here. And the formula is 3 times b sub k, and k is 1, so b sub 1 is 2, so I get 6. And then I just keep going. To find the next term, I go up by another one for k. So when k is 2, I get k plus 1, so 2 plus 1 equals 3 times b sub 2. All I'm doing to this step right here is I'm plugging k in to that formula. 2 plus 1 is b sub 3, and b sub 2, I found in the one before it, is 6, which is where I'm getting 18. I don't ever think this way, like I never actually plug k in, because I always just say, oh, I'm using the one before it. So I'm just going to take 3 times the one before it every time. So 3 times the one before it, 3 times the one before it, 3 times the one before it. And if you're not sure, plug it in. Like, start with what K tells you to start with, and fill in for K. And then you just plug in exactly what's there. the last one we were adding at the and and so that's what I did you could just kind of work it out again there is a formula that goes with it um, you could just take 3 to the 7th times 2 and you would also get the same number because 3 to the 7th is how many times you multiply by 3 and then you have to multiply by that original number again I don't like just work it out that's why they only ask you to find the 8th term if they asked you to find the 100th term you'd want to be finding these shortcuts if you're already seeing the shortcuts, that's great. That's kind of putting you ahead of the game on this chapter stuff. But that's the answer there. Questions on that? That works, yes. That's why it's not that high of a number, because they expect that that's probably what you're going to do. You don't actually have to write this down, but this is kind of where we're going with it. Because ever, like what we've just spent time on, yes, we had to talk about what it means to be but a lot of your homework today is just writing out sequences, finding the hundredth term if it's explicit, or maybe finding the eighth term if it is um, recursive. But we want to look to see something that you haven't done before um, when you deal with patterns, because we want to see what the end behavior is. And when I say end behavior, we mean what's happening as we keep going. Like, is it going forever up or forever down, or does it get closer and closer to a number? Um, and that's what we mean by end behavior. Like, what happens if we continue that sequence on forever, right? For infinity, what's going to happen to that sequence? And so, here's what you do need to write down. For any sequence, a sub n, is going to go towards a specific number. Finite. No, finite means a specific number. Like it goes to seven. That would be a finite number. The other 
thing that happens is your sequence could diverge or diverge, I guess I should say. If a sequence diverges, then that means as your numbers go up and up and up, as you look at higher and higher curves, it doesn't go to a finite number. It just keeps getting bigger or it keeps getting smaller, which we say that means it goes to infinity or negative infinity. So on your homework today, there are some problems that say determine whether this sequence diverges or converges and then find the number that it converges to with the day. And so uh, that's kind of what we want to look at. Like, does it go to a specific number or does it just keep getting bigger and smaller? So your sequence is the same as the present No, not really. You have to show me some work on how you know the answer right now. So not really much fancy answer for me. Determine whether the sequence converges or diverges. If it converges, state the number. If it diverges, you just say that it diverges. So it's going to go to infinity or negative infinity. Infinity is not a number, so you don't have to state it. And I hope that after we do a few of these and then you go to your homework, that you're going to kind of be able to pick out um, how are you going to know if it's going to get closer or closer to a number. Um, or how are you going to know that it's just getting closer to number? And on these problems, they list the first few terms, dot, 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 and then they give you the formula. This would be like the formula for the nth term, right? So if I plugged in 1, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 2, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. So that means for any term, like the hundredth term, would be 100 squared. So this one, I hope it's kind of obvious that the bigger numbers we plug in here, they're just going to keep getting bigger, right? And so one way you can show that is pick some numbers. So I pick like when n is 10, you get 10 squared or 100. And when n is 100, you get 100 squared, which is 10,000. How would you even stop there? But if we could pick 1,000, and we're just going to get 1,000 squared. So by just doing that, I can see that as n gets bigger, my sequence is just getting bigger, right? It's not going to go towards a specific number. I could even say as n goes to infinity, a sub n, or n squared, is also going to infinity. We kind of did this with like in behavior stuff, but kind of what we're looking at this. So you're right, Henry. Because it goes to infinity, we can say that this sequence diverges. It's never going to get to a specific number. you're just going to kind of keep picking bigger numbers for n and see what happens. And then maybe you can relate it back to um, that example. What does it converge to? So what we're trying to see is what happens as n gets bigger. So the way that I think is the best bet to do it is pick bigger and bigger values for n. Don't just pick 1,000 
you need to see what's happening. You don't know what's happening before a thousand. So I always take, I usually take like, let's take ten, let's take a hundred, and let's take a thousand. And if those are going towards the same number, then we probably could say that it is converging to that number. That's kind of what limits are too. We kind of the word limit has been in our book a lot, and I kind of avoid to talk about limits until calculus. But a limit is what's happening as you plug in bigger and bigger values. Sometimes it just goes infinity, and sometimes it converges to an exact number. And so if we plug in 10 here, actually I'm going to my paper here, you get um, 30 minus 1, which is 29, over 2 minus 30, which would be negative 28. And I just divided that so I could actually see what it's going towards, um, and that's about negative 1.0. If I plug in 100, I get 300 minus 1, which is 299, over 2 minus 300, which is negative 293. And that, as a decimal, was about negative 1.0033. So kind of see what's happening here, as opposed to the last problem. Like at 10, it was 100. At 100, it was 10,000. That's a pretty big jump. When we went from the 10th term all the way to the 100th term, the number didn't really change that much, right? Like, that's kind of t letting you know that I don't think it's really, I don't think it's diverging to infinity because it's not moving very much. If you plug in 1,000, um, 1,000 minus 1 would be 2,999 over negative 2,998. And I got negative 1.0. So it looks to me like that as n is getting bigger, my number is getting closer and closer and closer to negative 1. So we would say that it converges to negative 1. Thinking about it in terms of n behavior, you could say as n goes to infinity, a sub n is going to negative 1. Remember how we found horizontal asymptotes of a polynomial function? Like there were those little rules about the um, exponent, the degree of the numerator, and the degree of the denominator. That's it. Well, we've done that this year, and if you know those rules, it's kind of a shortcut to this, because the horizontal asymptote of that function is exactly where it converges to. The problem with using the rule for horizontal asymptotes is it only works with polynomial functions. That is not a polynomial function. 0.5 to the n power is actually an exponential function. And so that's where you have to think a little bit. And maybe you remember what the horizontal asymptote for an exponential function is. And guess what? That's going to be the same place that it converges to. Um, so that was a very But you don't even have to know those rules. It's just kind of a nice thing if you know them. It's very useful in these problems because you don't have to do so much work. Um, you can just pick the numbers. Pick 10, pick 100, pick 1,000, and see what's happening. Same as a half to the n power. Actually, I didn't even work on this out because I got super small super quickly. When you plug 10 in, that's like a half to the 10th power, which is like 1 over 1,024, or .0009766. And then when I plugged in 100 on my calculator, I got like 7.88 times 10 to the negative 31st power. And so this is where if you remember what exponential functions look like, it helps you. Or you need to make sure you know what scientific notation is, which I hope that you do. What is this?
this number really, really close to? Zero. Zero, because this negative exponent means we would actually move this decimal point 31 places this way and fill that all in the zero. So that's like point zero 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 forty nine times, thirty times, seven eight eight. So I didn't even do a thousand because it's just gonna keep getting smaller. Because it really doesn't. It just probably can't do any more um, decimals. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Like it's not really zero because we talked about this when we talked about exponential functions. Is there any number that you can plug in there or in that would ever make a fraction equal zero? No. <laughs> one over a thousand would be one over two to the one thousand, but that's such an insanely small number. That that's why your calculator just rounded it to zero, because it probably can't even, it's probably more than 10 to the negative 99. <coughs> yeah, because it's so small, like it's almost zero. And if you remember exponential problems, this problem would actually um, multiply, I guess it's a half, so it actually would look like this, right? Yeah. Right, it has a horizontal asymptote. That's what this end behavior is, so it's kind of connecting to that. But you don't even have to know that to do these because you can always just pick numbers. So we can say that this converges to zero. But you need to make sure that by the time we have a test that you know the difference between converges and diverges because I'm not going to tell you on the test what it means. And then you need to be able to show me what these are going to. Okay? Start this. Anyone else need to try to move their hands? 